the truth of the Bible less organically because we just can go to a bookstore and just grab it off the shelf in English, you know? It's like, oh, it's a lot, it's a lot more complex and, and, um, and historical and, and develop, you know, I mean, it takes a, it takes a, a church to give us the Bible. And a lot of times we try to form our churches out of the Bible instead of saying, well, the Bible was given to us by the church. That's a very interesting point, and, and, and one, I think, one factor I think is important is that um, if you look at late antiquity and before the complete fall of the Roman Empire, and mm-hmm. then, then Christianity eventually reemerged, you know, and uh, Charlemagne and that whole thing, that um, they're very intellectually sophisticated. And, you know, then, of course, there's the revival of scholasticism. Yeah. But so I, you would consider late antiquity like Augustine and all them? Yeah, Augustine I have serious problems with. Uh oh. <laughs> like you're like you're like, are we talking about this right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean Augustine. Too early. <laughs> I mean I recognize his. Not for me. I recognize okay, his. Good. I recognize his genius. Uh huh. But um, I guess with with Augustine, maybe I'm just seeing things where they're not there. But his, uh, sort of like this, I tend to suspect Manichaeism. Oh, that it might have like, creeped into his, um... Yeah, sort of, sort of the idea that um, sort of a negative attitude towards the body or towards this world. I could so- totally see that. Well, um, I would say that, yeah, exactly, no one's perfect. So even a church father, even a, an, a doctor of the church, a saint, um, isn't perfect. And I think right. where, where he would... Uh, his his shortcomings are where he would err, or I guess he would lean towards is a pl- platonic, you know, uh, probably negative attitude <laughs> towards sex and the body and all that, right? So that's interesting because I mean the connection with Plato, which of course is is I accept, but it's like I just hadn't explicitly made that connection, but it's it's oh obvious yeah, connection. I always associate Augustine more as no, he's he's. I mean, he was, he came back to Christianity he because he discovered Christian Platonists and Milana. That's his, yeah, my reading. Yeah, history. it was Ambrose. And, yeah, and Ambrose. And, and then and then I would say that the counter to that or the the recentering of that would be Thomas Aquinas and his use of Aristotle. Yeah, brilliant point. I mean, that's really good. That's uh, you know, I hadn't thought of it in those terms. Although now that you say it, it's obviously true that oh, yeah. the Platonic, you know. Augustine and then the Aristotelian Thomas. I mean, and he was he was using Aristotle when it was unpopular. I mean, no one, no Christian had really, because you, you really didn't have it. Augustine didn't have Aristotle readily at hand because it, it hadn't, I guess the Christian West received Aristotle once again through the Middle East. Yeah, like, Islamic, Islamic Renaissance. Islamic Renaissance, yeah. It, it, ironically, you know, through the Crusades, they came into contact exactly. all these things. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> what do they say in Spanish? They say, no hay mal que por bien no venga. There's no evil. Yeah. It doesn't come for some good. Ooh. No hay mal que por bien no venga. Well, Augustine would say that, too. <laughs> in, his, in, his, in his addressing of the problem of evil, he says, well, if, if God allows evil, it's because he's going to bring about a greater good. So, look, you, you do agree with Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> Have y'all seen into the church yet? No. You want to come in? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll give you a little I tour. I like churches. Um, uh, but then again, if I could just sort of continue on that. Yeah. I mean, as far as my understanding, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, which is definitely possible, and that is that there's sort of a line between Augustine to Calvin to, say, Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, I, I could, well, I'll say this. Augustine is the, the, uh, the favorite darling of Protestant theologians. Really? Yeah, I, th- I think that if there's a if there's a church father who is explicitly Catholic, and Augustine is explicitly Catholic, like Protestants are okay with Augustine because of his focus on grace. So he was he was opposing um, a guy named Pelagius, sort of earning your salvation. Yeah. So Pelagianism, the early church right, right. heresy of earning that you can earn your salvation. Well, Augustine, rightly so was fighting against that heresy and saying, no, you can't earn your salvation. I, I suspect he went too far in this sense. Okay. Let's say I have a child, which I don't. But but let's say I had a child. Or let's say I'm just, I mean, because I work with a lot of students. Uh-huh. So um, 
I mean, of course, let's say I have a student who's trying to learn. I mean, I mean, let's say a student can't do it all themselves. You need a teacher. Uh -huh. But at the same time, the way you raise a child, teach student, is you teach them reciprocity. You teach them that, that you earn it, but your earning it is under the, let's say, under the, the supervision or the grace, if you want to say it, of a good teacher. <clears throat> and so I think if you emphasize too much that you can't save yourself, then it, I, I think it, I remember when I took a course at UCLA ages ago in early Christianity, and the professor was saying that um, he felt that a, people like Augustine, like when he like infant baptism and all that, kind of cut a vital nerve in Christianity. Mm. The idea that, I mean, for the reason that Constantine didn't get baptized on his deathbed because, you know, I can't follow these rules. Mm. You know, I kill people, I have lovers and so, but, but the idea that it was almost like it, like a, like a, like an initiation where you agree to follow certain principles, and you cut that link, and you emphasize too much that you can't save yourself, then uh, the, the whole principle of reciprocity, where a good teacher or a good father or a good mother teaches you to earn things, like you know, I remember when I was hmm. eighteen, crazy teenager, and I, I was at Berkeley, and I. I told my mother, I think I want to go to Europe next summer. So my brother, my older brother, gone. She said, "That's mm -hmm. a great idea. Go out and earn money. Mm -hmm. You know, go out and earn the money." Yeah. Which I did, and so and and so she was my mother. I was, you know, but still, she taught me to earn things. Mm -hmm. And so, well, the church still has, and I think Augustine would still posit merit. Merit would be what you're talking about, right? That like we do have free will, and we do. Uh, choose to follow the commandments or do right. good things, love people, and and we receive merit because of it. But so I, I would say, like an Orthodox Catholic, and therefore August Augustine falls into that. Um, it's a both and. It's the tension between the the. the I, I that's you okay. Know? It's a tension. Yeah. It's like the and and this is where I always say, when studying, when preaching, when when anything, usually the truth is in the tension. Between two <laughs> things, right? It, it, so often we want to we want to ease the tension and go towards Manichaeanism, or ease the tension and go towards Calvinism, right? right. But actually, the truth is in Orthodox Catholic understanding of the world, which which Augustine was saying. Look, even our choice, even our ability to choose and exercise our free will, he would say, is a prevenient grace. Right? Is a prevenient grace so a different type of grace but it's a grace for us to even approach choosing but he doesn't destroy our free will and that's where calvin gets it wrong yes. right calvin says God, that kind of nutcase yeah he, he, uh, yeah i mean i'm really good friends with the Presbyterian <laughs> man at the same time and i played golf with him and i told him that but um he, yeah he could he completely destroys free will so i think like an interpretation of augustine that's Calvinistic is a bad interpretation. I don't think Augustine himself would, okay, fair enough. would be Calvin. Okay. Augustine was not Calvin. Okay, next one. Okay. And that is uh, another thing, original sin. Okay. Which doesn't make any sense at all to me in this because I, I, I'm, I'm like really into justice, hopefully not like a crazy social justice warrior, but I mean, I mean real justice. Mm -hmm. And so if I... It's like if I buy a new car and it has a bent axle, it's not my, you know, you say, well, that's your problem. No, it's, uh, you know, the factory, they, you know, it should be under warranty. And so I don't believe that I suffer because of what Adam did or someone else. I believe that God treats everyone as a free individual mm -hmm. and rewards or punishes them according to their behavior. Yeah. Well, I would, think, I would say there's a couple of responses that I would, in my own life, when I think about this, in my own life and history... Would you mind if I sit in the stuff? I have a little thing with my leg. Yeah, okay. It would just, yeah, I mean, just sit and talk. Because I really enjoy this conversation. I, and it's important to me because I don't want to make false arguments. Yeah. I take cheap shots. <laughs> mm -hmm. so beautiful. Oh, yeah.
then oh yeah we're going to it's just experientially I look at the experience of concupiscence that it's just our experience and I don't think anyone really can argue about it that we tend to sinfulness true right so so how how is that a reality like where does that come from oh, Ultimately, I would think the doctrine of original sin is just a theological expression of our experience of concupiscence, that we're all fallen and that we tend to sin. Okay, so, so if it's put that way, if someone says, okay, you wouldn't be in the material world unless you were sort of shopping for the wrong things. I mean, the fact you're in the material world means that you, know, you have some kind of mundane desires. I would say material, to, again, that's my very platonic, and that's very... <laughs> well, by that I mean, let me explain what I mean. I think I'm saying the same thing as you. By that I mean that rather than wanting to serve out of love, one wants to exploit mm -hmm. and enjoy things that ultimately belong to God, because the universe belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And so, Yeah, but, but that's that reality of our tendency to exploiting and using, or tendency to use, is a reality that we experience. Of course. So that's original sin. That's, that's it's, but, but it's, it's not inherent in, in physicality, right? So f existence, true, inherent, true. a use and sin and destruction and war and death is not inherent in reality, right? It's a deviation. It's, yeah, it's a misuse of, of the material yeah. world. So, but every human being that's ever existed experienced it. Although, and this gets into another, see, that actually is good in confessing all my theological problems with Christianity, but if it, I've, I've studied a lot and taught and, and been involved in certain uh, monotheistic traditions from South Asia. Mm -hmm. In fact, the German theologian Rudolf Otto Mm -hmm. When he studied this, he said, whoops, he said, we have a real theological challenger here because, because there is a highly developed, I mean, philosophically, theologically developed uh, tradition going back a very long time. In India, in fact, I think one of the common errors, even sometimes professors make, which is kind of irritating, they always say the monotheistic traditions, you know, the Abrahamic traditions, mm -hmm. whereas there's a very powerful monotheistic <coughs> tradition in South Asia, exemplified by the Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. which is an extremely monotheistic work. And so on that reading, and, and then getting back to the point here, uh, this world, I mean, there are great saints. There have, I mean, there have, there are great souls. In fact, the word great soul is Mahatma in Sanskrit. So there have been great saints, mm -hmm. great souls, who came to this world and showed an example of living in full devotion. Mm -hmm. And so then, um, but none of them has really been free from the from concupiscence. Well, you, but you would say you would say that no Christian saint was free of that. No, I mean other than Our Lady, but that's a different doctrine, the Immaculate Conception. I don't really want to get into it, but but there's a there's a special grace that she received, and we can go into the scripture right. about uh, Caracatomene right. and all. But even then, even then, let's say, take the, the figure of Jesus himself. I mean, and I know, because I, I kind of study these things, but I don't claim to know it as much as you do, but, but apparently the early debates and heresies and all that were a lot centered on, say, Christology, like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. fully man, fully God, or, or just... Or uh, Arianism, you know, yeah, Arius. Yeah, He's the highest creature. He's not God. Yeah, and so... I mean, I understand if someone has an experience which, say, in Aristotelian terms, is self-evidently true about the nature of Jesus, then obviously you can't, you can't argue with that conviction. But it seems if we could have like a neutral arena where, let's say, I have my convictions or my self-evident experiences and you have yours, mm -hmm. and it seems there should be a neutral area where we can discuss it. Not that I'm going to convince you necessarily, but at least sort of... Because it seems to me that among competing theologies, a neutral arena would be philosophy, mm -hmm. which kind of mediate. I think I'm not saying it's going to, you know, ultimately you're going to 
base your life on a philosophical rather than a theological discussion. Mm -hmm. But at least it seems it's a neutral arena that mediates discussions between theologies. Absolutely. It's so in that sense, so in that sense, I mean obviously the Christian tradition, perhaps their most important claim is about the identity of Jesus. And um, which was much debated even in ancient times. And then finally well, that's why, and this is why, I mean, so that's a broad philosophical, theological view, but in my world, like I'm usually just interacting with Catholics or Presbyterians or Methodists or whatever. And that's why it's very easy. Like people ask me, why am I Catholic? Well, I didn't come out of my mother's womb with a collar on. Like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a priest coming, you know, early. So it's like, why? Well, it's because, because I truly believe that in order to be confident in the truth, it had to be handed on, passed on. It had to be, there's an apostolic tradition. And, and people can argue from the other side of it, but within a Christian tradition, I don't know how you can stand and say like, oh yeah, I am starting an evangelical church down the street, you know, in, in whatever, suburbia, and I have it right. That, is like, <laughs> that blows my mind. It's like, no, I'm, I, there's no way. The only thing I give the people here is what's been handed on to me. No, from, I, the, from the church yeah. fathers, from the, so it's like, I accept that point. I yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't about you. It was about like no, saying, no, no, I understand. But, saying but, like this is a – and so I brought it up because you talked about the early heresies. And it's like, yeah, they're, they're working it out. And guess what? All of the, the churches down the street, the evangelicals, the non-denoms, the Methodists, the Anglicans, the uh, Presbyterians, all of it stands on the foundation of the struggle in the church – and an orthodox belief coming forth from that. And when you didn't believe that, it wasn't, you're not Christian. Like, well, if you don't believe that Jesus is fully God, fully man, then you're not Christian. Although, although, okay, going to that, because, first of all, in the Indian tradition that I've been most involved with, they, they accept absolutely that principle. In Sanskrit, it's called parampara, which means a succession of teachers going back to the original mm -hmm. source. Mm -hmm. So I accept that I'm not a, you know, trying to, I don't, I don't believe that you know, people can invent their own religions. But, and I, I've, I've studied, not, I'm not a great scholar, but I have studied a bit, particularly the fourth century AD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, yeah, when the, you know, Nicaea, the, that's Nicaea and, and, and Santa the, Claus, St. Nicholas. <laughs> I asked that question in trivia the other night. We had, we had bar trivia lead at the, at the Francis here, and I asked, what century did uh, Saint, uh, Santa Claus die? <laughs> and only one team got it. <laughs> so I, I have to admit here that I have a certain sympathy for what is now called the Arian heresy mm -hmm. in the sense that um, there's this really good book. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's by a scholar in some college in, well, I think it's George Mason University. Mm -hmm. We wrote a book called When Jesus Became God and it's just a book. He's not denying that Jesus is God. He's just he's just focusing on the fourth century mm -hmm. and all the debates that went on, and of course went back and forth. And there were times when most of the church fathers believed Arianism, and there were times when they believed and it, it went because there were four. There were times where a lot of the bishops did. Yeah, there were four variables. There were four variables: Eastern Roman Empire, Western Empire. I would say Eastern Emperor and Roman Emperor, and what they believed and then Arianism and the Trinitarianism. And so you have four variables, and it goes around and around and around. At times, both East and West were Arian, at times they were both uh, Trinitarian, at times they were split, and so it went around and around. And, and um, the basic, so anyway, I mean, you know, so you can get into the whole thing now, but, but so I'm just, what I'm saying now is not trying to deny saying, you know, what you believe is not true. But I'm just trying to philosophically sort of categorize it, not to dismiss it, but just for clarity. Mm -hmm. And so it seems that, I mean, I think Aristotle got this right, that ultimately we build knowledge systems on what we perceive to be self-evident truths, which therefore can't be pushed into infinite regress and can't really be yeah. refuted because we claim self-evidence for them. Yeah. And, and so when you have, okay, here's a question for you then. Okay. 
let's say you have a community in South Asia, which is monotheistic, uh -huh. believes in a personal God, believes <laughs> in tradition, all that, mm -hmm. and basically as, 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 ascribes to most of the same moral principles, which I would say is maybe going one up and you know avoiding cruelty to animals. And because I think anyway, Aquinas is the view that animals are you're assuming they're just like machines. That, so if you have these two things, you have these parallel systems, mm -hmm. which structurally, structurally have a lot of resemblance, and obviously make, I mean, to the extent that one or the other claims exclusivity, there must be competing claims. Good point. Yeah, I mean, to the extent that there's uh, an acceptance that God can reveal himself different ways in different places, I think that's not an open-ended principle, it can, can easily lead to absurdity. Mm -hmm but it's not absolutely wrong. And so if you have these competing claims, and let's say on the South Asian side, people who take to that tradition, in fact, do dramatically improve their conduct. They become moral, they give up, uh, let's say, you know, adultery, sex outside of marriage, and they just become much better persons. Mm -hmm. And they devote themselves to God. It seems to me that the claim that what they're doing is false or something like that, I don't see how it would be a philosophical claim other than to say my self-evident experience mm -hmm. is of this exclusive truth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what you're saying is not part of what I take to be self-evidently. Yeah. So it seems it's an appeal to self-evidence rather than an appeal to other forms of reason. Good point. Well, I, I just, I think that the developed theology of the Catholic Church the Catholic tradition through is received through the councils. So one of the first being Nicaea in the fourth century, but we've had 21 councils. Second Vatican Council in the 60s being the latest. Um, and the fullness, see, we see it, so there's a, there, we call it a chronic rigor. It's, it's that the fundamental truths, the apostolic faith does not change, but our understanding and development of those truths in form, we see it like a it could evolve. Evolve. Uh, John Henry Newman wrote about this a lot. He's a, a Anglican convert. The Newman centers. The Newman, Newman centers are named after him, right? He has a, a, the ideal of, of the university. Is one I see. I said to make sure I'm not late for. A, I have to. Oh, I, yeah. At eleven o'clock, I have a, actually an academic philosophical okay. theology meeting. So I, here, online. Okay, so. He, ta he talks about the development of doctrine, right. and, and he says, okay, it's, a, it's a, an acorn or a sapling, and then you have an oak tree. They're the same being, they're the same organism, but it develops over time and can look drastically different. Oh, so he said that. That's a very interesting point. Yeah, well, it, and it's, tr it's true. I believe it's true, um, and the church professes it, um, that you can develop doctrine. It cannot essentially change. But our development of it and our understanding of it can deepen. So that's the work of theologians throughout history. And that's why Catholics aren't like, well, it's, it was said like this in 325, and that's exactly how we have to understand it now. No, the is essence of it, the, the substantial nature of it, does not change. But our, our relationship to it can, because we change. And so it can develop. So taking our relationship with world religions. The most robust and up-to-date understanding of our relationships to world religions is found in the documents of the Second Vatican Council, and there's a document called Nostra Aetate, which I think if you haven't read, if you want to understand the, the Catholic Church's relationship to world religions and, and God's action within religions and, and people in general in different cultures, that is it, very essential. Nostra Aetate or Nostra Aetate? Nostra Atate, A T A T A E. <laughs> um, Nostra Atate. And it's, and it's just the, the church in relationship to world religions. And, and in it, the basic principle is, is that God can be experienced and understood in various ways. They, they call it rays of light. So there's bigger rays of light. There's some philosophy, some. Uh, Theologies, some religious expressions in different cultures that aren't Christianity that have a greater, a greater um, experience or expression of truth. 
And there's some that have lesser, right? Right. Okay, so taking that, and I like to I sort of connect that with Anselm's famous argument. Okay. You know, the ontological argument. Mm -hmm. Because it seems that it's always, that argument is always considered in one way, but then this other way, which even if you didn't intend it, is sort of entailed by the argument. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, that God is that thing in whom no greater being can be conceived. It seems, as, as far as I've learned, that he's arguing for the existence of God. But that's what his, his, his stated goal was. Yeah. Right. But then again, if you, the way I would sort of spin it, that if we accept that God is infinitely great, then it seems that the greatest concept of God would be most true. Not exclusively true, but most true. It's just like in math, you know, there's like elementary math and there's very advanced math and mm -hmm. so on. And so therefore, sort of taking the challenge of Anselm's argument, mm -hmm. it seems to me that one would have to defend the notion that a particular conception of God in this or that tradition is the greatest possible understanding of God. Mm -hmm. And if that turned out not to be the case, it doesn't mean that understanding is untrue. But it, but it, so, so it, to what extent has the Catholic, let's say, academic tradition, um, to what extent has that tradition Recognize, acknowledged or sort of taken on that challenge to show that a particular conception of God, let's say in the, pardon the vulgar language, marketplace of theologies, mm -hmm. you know, particular conception of God is the greatest conception, is the greatest monotheistic conception. Because to me, I make a distinction in my teaching between what I call tribal monotheism mm -hmm. and philosophical monotheism. Okay. Tribal monotheism, I think, being exemplified by certain evangelical mm -hmm. groups, or frankly, a, a big chunk of Islam, based on my personal experience and study. Mm -hmm. um, I think the entire, the church's entire understanding of itself it is expressed most fully in, uh, and I, I don't want to like deflect to like documents, but I mean, I'm just saying like, no, this is where the church yeah. expresses itself. And and um, but they take on directly that challenge, like okay, here's another, here's a competing monotheistic theology, but mm -hmm. this is actually superior for these philosophical reasons. Yeah, um, because if it just gets down to well, because we have self-evident experiences, we've experienced it, then it's. I mean, that's okay. I'm not saying that. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's but it's not. not that's that. not philosophy. Yeah, it's not that. I would I would say that um, Lumen Gentium is the document of the Second Vatican Council that expresses the church's understanding of itself. Nostra Aetate is the document that says this is our relationship with the outside world. Okay, so take those two together. If you read them, that would be where the church lays out its, philosophically lays out its theology about its understanding of itself. Anselm, I think his ontological argument was about, not about, He's not talking about theological constructs. He's not saying that the greatest possible theological con construct is therefore the, the best or right. He's talking about God is that which nothing greater can be thought. He's talking about God per se, oh, not right. God expressed by us or understood by us. Right. So True. I, I think that that extrapolation might be inappropriate to place upon Anselm. Like he's like... I was just sort of going to the language. I mean, yeah. I understand. I, mean, I think you're basically it's not Anselm's argument; it's your argument. You okay. know, but I, w I would say, like the best theology is that which nothing greater can be thought is what your argument would be. Yeah, I mean, well, what I'm or, or God is that because he does say, if I got it right, uh, that God is that being in whom no greater being can be conceived, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually engaging in something now which I normally despise, and that is deconstructionism. Mm -hmm. Like saying, like, you know, whatever Anselm's, whatever Anselm's intention, if you take the language itself on its surface, it seems that, so therefore I wouldn't attribute that to Anselm, but you're yeah. using his... Yeah, I'm not attributing it, I'm not saying this is what Anselm was doing, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that if you take his statement as philosophically important or meaningful mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. interesting, intriguing, mm -hmm. then here's something you can do with that language. 
rather than anachronistically attributing my concerns to them. So I got you. You're deducing. You're not putting that into. You're not. Uh, yeah, because I don't think. I said Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's what he was talking about. I mean, yeah. my concern, I'm confident, was not his concern. Yeah. Because that was the only game in town when he wrote that. You, you know, so he didn't have to talk because, you know, for those people, other religions are just kind of like beyond the pale. Yeah. Which is why the, the development of doctrine is important, right? Yeah. See, like you, I would never, and this is why it, in our battles right now in the church, we're, we're, there's an internal battle between uh, radical traditionalists and, and just Orthodox Catholicism, you know, people saying like, pointing out, well, St. Saint, uh, Augustine said this about it's uh, sex. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, guess what? We've had, you know, 1,500 years of development since Augustine said that. You can't. Mm -hmm. Are you Catholic? Because if you're Catholic, you, you trust by faith. You trust in God's guidance of the church, not just until the 300s or 400s, not just a, up until 1572 with the Council of Trent. You trust in God's guidance of the church throughout, even now. Yes. Through the fallenness of, of vicious popes and scoundrels, through people, they don't like Francis because he says this, they don't like Francis because he <laughs> says that. Like, through all that. Yeah. Like, you trust if you're Catholic. And so, like, you, people try to quote different era, eras of, or, or time periods of Catholic theology and say, like, look, this is what we should believe now. This is how we should express it now. A, a, a prime example is... Um, Extra Ecclesia Nulla Salus, the principle that there's no salvation outside of the church. Okay? Have you ever heard that phrase? Extra Ecclesia Nulla no, Salus. I'm aware, I'm aware of the idea. Yeah, the idea is that, that like nobody will be saved outside of the church. That is a, a infallibly held doctrine, and I believe it. But I don't, I don't believe it. I don't mean it. By saying that, I don't mean that someone who's outside of the uh, temporal or, or uh, you know, physical construct of the Catholic Church cannot be saved, right? Um, so then how do you understand church? I understand it that if somebody is saved and when they are saved, if they're not explicitly Catholic, they're still saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, right? You're not saved, but we're all saved by the same grace. We're all saved all right. by the same love of the one God, okay? That, that he mediates through the church, even if it's in an extraordinary way. I understand that. So th that's actually, I mean, just to be honest here, uh, that's something which philosophically or theologically I, I really struggle with. And that is, uh, I'll just briefly because I'm sure you've heard it a million times. Like during his mission, when Jesus was actually walking on the earth, mm -hmm. and there are cases where he claimed to forgive people of their sins or mm -hmm. say the power of attorney from God or however you read it. In fact, that was one of the main accusations against the Philip Pontius Pilate. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a whole, I mean, my present understanding of Jesus is that, um, well, first of all, like, the, like, I don't, I can't grasp as much as I talk about it or think that the concept that God doesn't just have the power to forgive us. I mean, to say someone's father has children and they do something wrong. Mm -hmm. It's at the discretion of the father and mother to say, okay, because punishment is not gratuitous. Punishment is meant to improve people. I mean, people that punish just to cause pain to others are mm -hmm. bad people. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm a father and I punish a child, it's for the child's good. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, the idea that someone suffered for me, first of all, it, I, it, it seems to me it kind of defeats the whole purpose of suffering at all. And secondly, God, or Jesus you could say, mm -hmm. to me has the power to forgive sin and, and there's no ransom. I mean, who are you paying it to? Like, like in that first Narnia movie, mm -hmm. there was a scene that I thought, Frankly, it just didn't. It made no sense to me whatsoever. 
And that is where the white queen or something comes mm-hmm. and kisses the devil. Oh, and she gets uh, Aslan and like tortures yeah. him and all this stuff. Yeah, it's definitely a Christian symbol or a Christ yeah. figure. Oh, oh, it's very much a it's very much a symbolic Christian movie. But but the part that really I thought that made no sense to me is when she says that I have the right to claim the sword as Edward or something because he did this or that, which is silly that to me because in the movie because. He's just some kid separated from his parents in some weird world and he didn't know what to do and so I mean that played a sin. But in any case, when when the lion didn't want to hand over Edward, and then and here's the point. The queen said, It's the law. Mm-hmm. And so um, if God is God, then there's not a law that he has to obey. You could say, Well, God made the law. But the, I mean, but then Jesus himself said that the um, the Sabbath is made for man. Man is not made for the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. So if you take that statement, taking it as historical, mm-hmm. if you take that statement and apply it to the white queen and to the lion, mm-hmm. then God can make a law, but as a lawmaker, he can adjust his law. Mm-hmm. The law can have nuances. The law can have, as, as real laws actually do. Mm-hmm. And so the idea that God has to obey a law yeah. It, that that even if God made the law, it seems like so wise lawmakers don't make rigid laws that admit of no extenuating circumstances and exceptions. Yeah, exactly. And and we don't believe God does either. So I mean, we don't we don't believe that God, out of necessity, had to be incarnate. We don't believe that God, out of necessity, had to die on the cross. Um, well, good, because some Christians, I mean, people claim to be Christians yeah. very much well, claim that. Exactly. Well, that's what happens whenever you detach yourself from apostolic tradition, or right? Just, or just from, when you, or just from, the, or just from a, a, a serious theological tradition. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but there's serious, or that are pretty mainstream serious theolog- theological traditions that, in the sense that they're historical, they have centuries under their belt, but they still detach themselves from the what I would say the apostolic tradition. So they detach themselves from the bishops. There's no longer a protection. And, and again, I'm gonna talk in terms of, of Christian divine revelation that I believe, I truly believe it, um, that there's a protection of our belief whenever we allow ourselves to, to be under the authority of the church that Christ founded. And as soon as we break away from that, for whatever reason, we expose ourselves to various splintering and errors and whatever, having some wacky th- idea come into our theology that we preach from the pulpit. Because, um, I, I, man, if it was up to me, I'd be, I'd be preaching heresy, you know, all the time because I'm just, you know, I'm, fa- I'm falling. I'm going to be... Uh, who is it? It was... Um, it might have been Anselm who, who wrote about the incarnation, the necessity of the incarnation. And he said it, it's not out of necessity, it's about fittingness. And then God chose to do it. So, like, it happened. Right, but I, but I the problem I have with that is that, um, let's say taking that line of reasoning, mm-hmm. that I don't understand as a general principle, speaking of God or humans or whoever, that sort of embracing unnecessary suffering like that famous phrase, for God so loved the world. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think sacrificing, if you believe in the Trinity, or say part of yourself or part of God, that it's, it just doesn't seem like, for example, let's say I have a child, and I really love my child, and my child is doing some bad things while I help my child. Mm-hmm. I just, it would never be an option for me to somehow undergo some suffer, unnecessary suffering. I mean, if it was necessary, like, in order to save my child, I had to go to some very cold place and, you know. But is that necessary? It's not necessary, it's not morally necessary. No, and, it's, and so I don't. That's the point, right? Right, but I don't, in other words, I don't think Jesus suffering in any way, taking him to be a divine being, nece- you know, is necessary to increase his empathy. So among the ways in which it's not necessary, one way it's not necessary is to increase his empathy. And another way it's not necessary, in my view, is that I sort of don't believe in it. It, it seems to me it's kind of like this ancient Middle Eastern idea of sin, almost like some 
substance in the world that has to go somewhere. It has to go somewhere, and so Jesus said, okay, mm -hmm. I'll take it, because it, it has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Which is, well, which, I mean, isn't there, I mean, your idea... It seems like reifying the idea, notion of sin. Yeah, I get what you're, okay. Yeah, making it a thing that has to go somewhere. Justice, though, there is justice, right? Which is someone receiving their due, right? True. And so what is due to us, and so there is... There is um, well, I would respond to that. I get your point, but I would respond to that. That um, surrendering to God, like Jesus said, I think, was it to the adulteress, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. And so, truly surrendering to God, not just diplomacy, but actually giving yourself to God, to me is so powerful that the fact that, let's say, a true submission to God frees one from sin does not violate the principle of justice due to the importance and the power of that submission to God. Mm -hmm. If I just surrender the judge, or you know, like they say, a, a good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer knows the judge, so. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so, so, so I don't see how, like when Jesus said to the adulteress, he didn't say, wait a second, I have to bleed because my blood you know, will wash you or something. He just said, I forgive you, you know, by the power invested in me or... Yeah, well, I mean, in, in, obviously, I don't know, I don't think it's necessary that God had to die on the cross. But he did, and he revealed himself that way. And he, the graces we receive came through the cross as expressed through scripture and, and him revealing revelation. Again, we got to... At some point, we either accept divine revelation of scripture or we don't. Okay, but taking that point, let, let's say, going with that, that in a particular part of the world, I know you're in, you know, not like this non-universalist interpretation, but let's say in a particular part of the world, and for people in many other parts of the world, or all parts of the world, at a certain point, God chose to do it that way. But by your saying it's not necessary, he just chose to do it. Let's go with that for now. Mm -hmm. That logically leaves open the possibility that it's because it's not necessary, it's not required, and therefore God in other times or places or with other people can save them without doing that precisely because it's not necessary. And so I, what I don't, what I find hard to see as logical is not the truth of Christianity, but the claim of exclusivity that God at no other time and place freed people from their sins by other means. And so mm -hmm. I, I don't see any compelling logic. To yeah. That. Well, I would say that we don't... It, I guess the only part of the current understanding of extra ecclesia nulla salus that you don't buy is that when people are saved, they're outside of the visible confines of the right. church. And it's through the grace of Jesus Christ. It's okay. through the grace of the church. Because you're like, well, he's not bound by that. And I get it, but he's revealed that to him. Okay, I can interpret that in a way that, you know, probably won't fully satisfy you. But at least the language, you know, what you're saying. If you take Jesus to be God, mm -hmm. then to say that you can only be saved by God, you know, things equal the same thing or equal each other. So I would accept it in that sense, that, that if... When you say Jesus, you mean God, mm -hmm. and then you say you can only be saved by Jesus, meaning you can only be saved by God, but I accept it. Mm -hmm. And then if you say the other point was um, the church, if one takes what I would say is a larger view of the church, which <clears throat> you may feel is just a, you know, a deviation rather than an enlargement, but, but if, if, if I say there is a greater church, which is all the people in various traditions, that for the right, with the right motives mm. are really trying their best to surrender to God, trying their best to devote mm -hmm. themselves to God, and that there's a natural community of those people. Mm -hmm. And and we all need... I mean, the word in Sanskrit would be satsanga. You may have heard him sort of like insufferable in the white circle, but... Mm -mm. But anyway, <laughs> so, no, no. <laughs> so, satsanga means... Well, here, there's this great... Motto on the, I, I did my graduate work at Harvard, so um, when I go back from Boston to Harvard Square, there's this old plaque on an old bridge, a lot of old stuff there. Uh -huh. And it says, the community of the wise is the welfare of the world. Yeah. And, and so if you take it, the community of the wise, the community of people who sincerely 
to the best of their knowledge and to the best of their ability are trying to serve God, trying to submit to God, then I think those very sincere people, in a sense, form a natural community and that outside of community, it's like the Sunni concept, mm -hmm. of course, has led to all kinds of barbarities, but, but if you take, it's the idea that we all need spiritual community, we all need to be part of the mm -hmm. community, the wise, the community, the faithful. So in that sense, I could accept all the things, you know, of course, I'm obviously tweaking it my own way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, oh, I, I have to apologize, I do have to, yeah. I really enjoy this, I mean, it's, one thing I have to say for Catholicism, I started to get, I'm learning not exactly walking into various forms of evangelical Protestant churches and have discretion on this level. Mm -hmm. well, I have some wonderful teachers throughout the years, and, um, I mean, I admire the fact that even the Pope and, and obviously many other people do very serious what I would call philosophical theology. So I really respect that. I think that's really good. Well, thanks for coming to visit our, our beautiful church. Unfortunately, I'm leaving, well, actually we're going to be, no, Sunday I have to drive and give a talk in uh, New Orleans. Okay. And so assuming that I, you know, get out of New Orleans alive. <laughs> 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 yeah.